The greatest and most treasured blessing of my life is that I have the privilege of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. I have such amazing love for him. And most days are incredible. They, the joy, the hope, the confidence is without measure. But it's not always easy. It's just not. There are days that are difficult. And today is such a day. One week ago, I visited the home of one of my dear friends. He's been a good friend for 20 years, more than 20 years, actually. And I have come to love him, his family, his children. I remember having them in my classes when I was a Sunday school teacher in the Mormon church, and I grew truly to love them. I stopped by his house to invite him and his wife to join Grace and I for a, a dinner and a Christmas concert. I invited him to this last year and he wouldn't come. So I thought I'd try again. I suppose I'll try again next year as well. My love for Brian isn't going to fade, no matter what the other circumstances are. Brian is a high priest and a high councilman in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He sat in on my excommunication hearing and voted, I suppose, to have me excommunicated. I, I don't know all those details, and that's okay. But Brian is a friend. He truly is, in my mind, a friend. While I was at his house, I took the opportunity of sharing some of what God has done in my life, in, in Grace's life, over the past two years. In our ministry in the prisons, our ministry working with those that have recently been released from incarceration, our love for these people, our ministry among partner churches from Boise to Utah. These things are so incredible and so important to us. And in this ministry, we have been able to assist in a small way people as they transition from the bondage, from the chains of Mormonism to a God who sets them free. It's been incredible to watch. And so I bore witness of this to Brian. And it's sad because most Mormons, not all, but most Mormons eventually revert to the Sanhedrin playbook, which is to immediately, immediately bring false witness against whoever is sharing Christ with them. And so Brian did. A year and a half ago at my excommunication hearing, I made a statement that the Mormon church uh, has twisted and manipulated and morphed to paint me as something very, very evil. I'd like you to listen to those words right now. And what I would like to do, Garn, and I'll be honest with you, is I would very much like to make my statement tonight and walk away and call this the end of it. But I will tell you this, that if I don't make my statement here tonight, and if I do make my statement out there in front of the camera, I will print the handbills. I've already walked this district once as a potential legislator, and I will go door to door, and it will be your children and your families who will bring answers to you that you can't answer without lying. So now you've heard what I said. Let's listen to a few of Brian's statements that show how he has twisted this into something very, very dark. Well, you threatened to go after the kids. I did not. Yeah, you did. You threatened that you were going to go around and you were going to spread the thing to the kids in the school. As you heard, Brian is insisting that I threatened to infiltrate the schools and target the children. And here's another. Was I violent? Just because of your threats to go after the kids. And Brian, I didn't threaten to go after the kids. I threatened to go out and talk yes, to people. That's what you did. I, I threatened to spread your anti-religion stuff to the kids. Now you can see that Brian has asserted that I have threatened to use violence to enter the churches and specifically target the kids. Did you hear that in my statement? You see, there is a pattern here. There's a pattern. And the church always follows the playbook of the Sanhedrin. They bring a, a false witness. You see, during my excommunication hearing, my only plan was to go there, witness of Christ, because God had put it on my heart, I think. At least I was feeling that. That there was one or more men in the high council 
that had questions they dared not ask and could not answer. I wanted to go and bring Jesus into that room. And if they had allowed me to do that, which their handbook requires, I would have given a short statement and presented them with a resignation letter that I was leaving the church. And my intention there was that I would sever at that point, on that day, all relationships, all communication with the church. I simply want nothing to do with that church again. And I would have done that if they had allowed me to do that, if they had followed their own handbook. But they didn't. And so I had to report. Instead, they called the police while I peacefully gave a witness of Jesus Christ that lasted only a couple of minutes. They placed a 911 call, and three police officers showed up to break up a disturbance that never was. And, and this is proven by the audio, which I secretly captured of that hearing. Them, not knowing that I had recorded the hearing, sent a request to the legal office for the church, Kirton McConkie in Salt Lake City. And they distributed a letter which painted me as a violent man, as a, a danger to all Mormons, and specifically as a danger to the stake president, Garn Lovell. If they hadn't borne false witness, if they hadn't brought the Sanhedrin playbook into action with their false witness, I would have had nothing to report. But because of what they did, I reported on that evil. Following carefully the specific instructions of the Kirt McConkie letter, I took my wife to the funeral of a 20-year friend, of her closest friend in our valley, and we were driven away. Had they allowed us to attend the funeral as their letter requires, I would have had nothing to report, but instead there was that evil again, and I reported on it. If Dan McConkie, one of the lead attorneys from Kirton McConkie, had not threatened prosecution and arrest against me, even for attending the funeral of my own mother, I would have had nothing to report. But we are required to resist evil and to make it known. Had the church not filed a false copyright violation against my website while I was at Manti, Utah during the Mormon miracle pageant witnessing to people who desperately need Jesus, I would have had nothing to report. But they lashed out against me, and so I reported on that evil. And now the church, through Brian and others, are committing criminal defamation of character. You heard what Brian said, but it's equally important to understand what they're doing. You see, since my excommunication, they place security guards at the doors of the Mormon churches. They're not trying to push you out or throw you out or anything else. Okay. They have security people at the doors up there at the church. They do. And they have been, t and, and I have heard it from several people that the word is that they are there to protect the people from me. They're there to make sure that you don't come on the property. Okay, Brian, think about that. Have I ever tried to violate that law, that order? Just at Liz's funeral. But the, but the, what did the letter say? I am not welcome to come onto church properties to attend church meetings. And even when we... You're not allowed on any church property for any reason. Brian, the letter says, I'm not allowed to come on church property to attend church meetings. And so I went, and I knew that I might be kicked off. But Liz is a longtime friend. I know, and that broke her heart when she died. But it didn't break your heart to drive Mindy away from a funeral of her best friend and longest friend in our Auckland. She loved Liz. And, and so you have these guards up there to make sure I don't come and do I what? Don't, I don't have any guards up there. Brian, to do what? When, when I showed the letter, you probably listened to the audio. The only, when, the, the only reason they're keeping you off oh, church property is because they know you'll start going anti-Mormon on everybody. And Brian, that is such stuff. a... I have a good friend and he came out of Mormonism about the same time I did. And he called me one day. I can have him give you a call. He called me one day and he said, I've been thinking maybe I should go to Mormon churches to fast and testimony meetings and I should stand up at the pulpit and I should bear my testimony of what I know Christ is. What do you think? And I said, you know, man, I love you and I love your zeal in this, but I wouldn't do that because that is their place and I would never go into their church and cause a disturbance. And you're smiling like you don't believe me. 
No. Brian, I have never gone onto I've never gone onto the church property anywhere and caused a disturbance. I have never gone in and preached anti Mormon stuff. I have never That's what they were worried about though. That's why they did the the order against you for that. Did I ever give any indication that I would? Or yes. did, when you said that you were gonna go and teach their kids. I said door to door. I said, I will walk this neighborhood the same way I did when I was, and, and when I was in that campaign, did I ever once go into a church to do it? Nope. Nope, I didn't. I didn't, Brian. The people in my community have been told specifically that the guards are there to protect them from me because of my intent to violently attack their children and cause them harm. You see, there's a reason for what they do. There is a reason for what they do. It's fear. State President Garn Lovell would have allowed my statement, except he was afraid of the words of Christ. He's not afraid of me, he's afraid of Christ. They would not have attempted to silence me by making a false police report, except they were fearful that I would speak the words of Christ. They did not send out the letter to make all of the people in this community fear me, except they wanted the people to fear me to the degree that they would not speak with me. You see, that's, that's the playbook of this church. They would not have driven me away from the funeral of a dear friend, except they wanted the people to fear me. They would not have drugged me into criminal court and kept me there all summer last year except they needed to convince the people that I was a criminal and a danger to them. And why? Because they fear that the that people might listen, that the people might learn the truth. They would not have brought the false copyright violation against my website, except they wanted to bring it down so that people could not find the Word of God. And now this criminal defamation, this this defamation of character, this placement of security guards. It's all for the same reason. They need the people to be afraid so that people won't think, that they won't listen, that they would just slam their doors and refuse to hear the words of God. I tried three times to contact Brian so that we could settle this without making a public statement. I, I didn't want to do this. That's what makes this so hard because Brian's my friend, but still, this is evil and it needs to be addressed. Three times I called and three times Brian refused to take the call and three times Brian did not return my calls. So now I put it out this way. Brian, I'm so sorry, but your wife is going to hear this. Your children who I love and I don't want to hurt are going to hear this. Your son, your teenage son who sat on the couch and listened to our conversation all the while thinking that his father was speaking truth. He will now hear my statement and he will hear your words and he will know that you have lied. And your children will have a tough decision to make. They will either, they will either follow in your footsteps and become lost they will follow your footsteps into destruction or they will see the truth and it will break their hearts because they will know what their father is. But perchance they will become men of honor, women of honor, women who represent and men who represent the Lord Jesus Christ in truth. I would like to see your whole family take that route. Defamation of character is defined this way, quote, defamation is a false statement someone makes about you, which they publish as a statement of fact and which harms your personal and or professional reputation or causes you other damages, including financial loss and emotional distress. Brian, that's what you're doing. It's defamation of character. That's what you're doing, Brian. It's a criminal act. Brian, I have I have a reason to take action against you, but I won't. You see, I want this to stop. I have tried to sever all communication between myself and the church while retaining communication and friendship with those people that I love. I'm ready today to let it go. I'm ready today to stop. I'm ready today to have nothing to report, but that's up to you. 
You see, if you and Rock Perman and Garn Lovell and the, the 12 on the high council and Garn's counselors and the cowards in Salt Lake City, if they continue to strike out, I will continue to report. But the beauty, Brian, is that you cannot touch me, you cannot hurt me, you cannot harm me, you cannot affect me, and you cannot stop me because this is the mission of Jesus Christ. I am reminded of a passage, 1 Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 13. It reads, Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it in gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame, for it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. I'm Lance Earl. I'll see you soon.